You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. This is a reading of a cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled Eurythmy Therapy, Collected Works, Volume 315, translated by Alan Stott. This is uh, an appendix which is uh, entitled How Eurythmy Therapy Came About and Its Significance. Reports by Erna van de Venter Wolfram, Elizabeth Baumann, and Isabella de Jaeger. First is Erna van de Venter Wolfram. Erna van de Venter ne Wolfram, 1894-1976, to Eurythmist, one of the first pupils of Eurythmy. Her interest in the therapeutic side of Eurythmy led to Rudolf Steiner's decision to hold the lecture course eurythmy therapy. For decades she was active as a eurythmist and eurythmy therapist. I have two rather faded pieces of paper in front of me. One is a small drawing of the Cassinian curve and the other is a postcard dated February 1921 from Dr. Roman Bus, the, or- the organizer at the time in Dorna. Two modest pieces of paper and yet they are almost the only visible testimonies of the events that led up to the Eurythmy Therapy Lecture course that Dr. Steiner gave in Dornach in the spring of 1921, alongside the second lecture course for doctors, CW 313, Collected Works, Volume 313. If I want to go back in memory to the time when Dr. Steiner gave the first Eurythmy Therapy exercises, I have to go much further back than 1921. As early as 1915, and even earlier, In answer to our questions, Dr. Steiner gave me, and probably other eurythmy teachers too, various eurythmy exercises for speaking, and hints for their use in the special cases we had encountered in towns all over Germany. The term Heil Eurythmy did not even exist then. Dr. Steiner called these exercises therapeutic eurythmy and said that these arose out of the Greek mysteries. This remark will perhaps show how earnest he was, even at that time, about the art of healing by means of eurythmical movements. It will also show how deeply it was impressed upon the consciousness of us, still very young teachers, that Heilung, healing, is connected with Heil, sacred, holy. Our movements in this eurythmy therapy would really have to be carried out, by, excuse me, carried by quote the will to heal. Close quote, if we wanted to achieve any success with this therapy. Dr. Steiner on, only later coined the expression the will to heal in 1923-24, whereupon he entered into our problems and gave the lecture course for young medical students. Anyone who worked with Dr. Steiner in any way will remember that everything he gave was in answer to a question, a wish, or sometimes even a vague aspiration that came his way. It was the same with eurythmy therapy. For example, two children with speech defects were brought to him, and he gave what we would later on have called eurythmy therapy exercises. In 1919, I met a child with curvature of the spine. Dr. Steiner entered into my questions very thoroughly and gave me the help I wanted. I could give many more examples like this. Yet at the same time, I myself was also learning in the course of giving lessons to observe people, and I learned to unite the various phenomena I observed in a person, and to become aware of how many people in the numerous eurythmy courses round about were in need of help. During those years, I often met Elizabeth Baumann, Dolphus, who was also one of the first eurythmists. A deep love for the work we shared united us for many years. In 1919, after the end of World War I, we encountered one another again when the Waldorf School was being founded. So we began to exchange our experiences, she being a teacher at the Waldorf School, where she worked with Dr. Schubert's remedial class, and I being a eurythmist who, in the course of the year, gave eurythmic courses in almost all the big towns in Germany. I had the privilege when I was in Stuttgart of standing in for Frau Baumann at the Waldorf School when she was ill. 
we each had much joy in the other, because we were aware of our common bond. We were both searching for the same thing. This was the healing element in or behind Eurythmy. This was one of the threads of destiny that bound us together. The other one was my engagement and marriage to H. A. R. Vandeventer, himself a doctor. He approached Eurythmy from a background of medicine with the same enthusiasm that we approached medicine from a background of Eurythmy. And what gave rise to it? The lecture course on natural science given in Stuttgart during the Christmas season 1920-21. Frau Baumann and I went to this lecture course, more as visitors really, since we could not understand very much of what Dr. Steiner was saying, and as Eurythmists we hardly even belonged to that enlightened gathering of students and scholars. But even if we did not understand it all with our intellects, our enthusiasm for the astronomical drawings made up for it. One day Dr. Steiner drew something on the blackboard that made us nudge each other and nearly jump up, and that was the Cassinian curve. This was the external occurrence that we needed to make us aware that the paths of the stars and the flow of forces within us both sprang from the same source. For this curve of Cassini that Dr. Steiner was now describing, in connection with natural science and astronomy, why, we Eurythmists knew it too. As early as 1915, in the white room of the first Gertianum, Dr. Steiner had given four to six Eurythmy teachers a series of lessons, and on this occasion he taught us children's forms, good for children and young people from the age of three to eighty, to stop their thoughts getting scatty. Those were his words, and one of th these forms was the Cassinian curve, to the words, quote, We want to seek one another. We feel each other near. We know each other well, close quote. In 1915, we young people did not have the least idea why he gave this form as an educational exercise. In fact, we hardly knew the why of any of the Eurythmy teaching material. And to be honest, do we know it that much better today? And yet it should be our task to pass on to our successors not only the exercises, but also the why. The only way to do this seems to be that in the Eurythmy of the future we must separate truth from error and the source of Eurythmy from a watering down of it. This experience of recognizing such an apparently insignificant form was what drew me to Elizabeth Baumann and what caused her and my husband to sit together for hours discussing the problem. Quote, if this form which Dr. Steiner was illustrating in the Natural Science Lecture Course is so important for both macrocosmic man and microcosmic man, then does not everything given us in Eurythmy come from the same source, and should it not be applicable for therapy? Close quote. For just as with the Cassinian curve, we had also over the years learned about the cosmic and the human healing effect of vowels, for instance, Aum, our experience of the Cassinian curve was really only the cornerstone of the building of our surmises and experiences in the realm of Eurythmy. But how is it to be done? How are we to acquire a knowledge of Eurythmy therapy? What we knew up till then, Elizabeth Baumann and I, were only small building stones that on occasion Dr. Steiner had given us. Through the fact that my husband, as a doctor, supported us in our ideas, he had done quite a lot of Eurythmy himself and could understand and support our endeavors from both the medical and the Eurythmical side. This gave us courage to ask Dr. Steiner, whilst he was still in Stuttgart, whether he would like to teach us a kind of Eurythmy therapy in a systematic way, just as he had taught us ordinary Eurythmy. Dr. Steiner was very kind, looked at us somewhat astonished at our bold plans, and said he would discuss the matter further with my husband in Holland, and then we would hear. And thus it took place. Dr. Steiner was in Holland at the beginning of 1921, and as my husband was strongly connected to our work through his medical studies, he had a good deal of opportunity to talk with Dr. Steiner. Frau Baumann was in Stuttgart at the time, and I was in Breslau. But we had both set down our wishes very clearly in writing and sent them to my husband, still my fiancé at that time. At any rate, 
Dr. Steiner asked him one day in Holland, quote, Do you actually have some eurythmists who would really put their backs into eurythmy therapy? Close quote, to which my husband replied, quote, Yes, indeed, two at present, Frau Baumann and my future wife. Close quote. Then we can start with that, said Dr. Steiner, and instructed my husband to do the necessary organizing. This brings me back to the beginning, for the little drawing was the Cassinian curve, which came from an evening's discussion with Dr. Steiner and the faded postcard from Roman Bus, who was his announcement from Dornach to say that the Eurythmy Therapy Lecture Course, parenthesis Dr. Steiner had now coined the name, close parenthesis, was due to take place in Dornach at the beginning of April, Collected Works, Volume 315, along with the second doctor's lecture course, Collected Works, Volume 313, which was also due to be given then. In an article, Erna van de Venter Wolfram, describing how it was, writes, During the second doctor's course from 12 to 17 April 1921, Dr. Steiner gave the Eurythmy Lecture Rhythmy Therapy Lecture Course in six lectures for doctors and also for eurythmists who had been training for more than two years. Not one of us could imagine what the lecture course would be like. Dr. Steiner stood on the platform and Frau Baumann and I, sitting on two chairs in front of it, felt very uncomfortable, for we had instigated the situation. In the meantime, from February till April, we had heard no word from Dr. Steiner as to how he would establish this new branch of medical science with the likes of us, who had not the slightest preparatory training in the realm of medicine. We certainly did not have the necessary knowledge for eurythmy therapy work. Would it not have been much more practical and sensible for Dr. Steiner to have chosen a small group of doctors for this work? Or did Frau Baumann and I, being eurythmists, really brings something with us out of our past that seemed important to him. In the instructions he gave me shortly after the course about the training necessary for eurythmy therapy, I received my answer. He answered our questions by saying, quote, The prerequisite for the profession of eurythmy therapist is that you first of all know the whole foundation of artistic eurythmy in theory and practice. You must be capable of performing a dramatic poem on stage, for example, Goethe's Der Zauberlehrling, The Sorcerer's Apprentice, and carry out all the eurythmical indications for the meaning of the words and the sentence construction with all the forms and postures you have learned. Not until you have mastered all the aspects of artistic eurythmy are you ready to change over to eurythmy therapy. Close quote. He made it clear to us that we would first of all have to master all the possibilities of artistic eurythmy, be able to find them in the cosmos as the forces of the planets and the fixed stars, then in their reflection in human speech and music, then through movements of the human body itself. And in this way we would get to know the human being, that is, ourselves, as beings who reflect macrocosm and microcosm in our own body. Not until we had grasped our situation and task would we be able to advance from the periphery of eurythmy to the center of the healing aspect of eurythmy. Yet, quote, first of all you must know the periphery, and then you can move on to the center of man, close quote. What a perspective for us, who had already been actively engaged in artistic and educational eurythmy for eight years, though more in a practical way, and by learning from doing it rather than filling it with our consciousness, the vowels, consonants, parts of speech, rhymes, how much more significant they now appeared to be. What a rhythmist should know is also clearly defined by Dr. Steiner, telling me what and how I would have to learn from my husband's textbooks, those of Professor Spalteholtz and Professor Brosica. Dr. Steiner told us this shortly after the Eurythmy Therapy Lecture Course so that it was with a deep feeling of responsibility that we took our departure from Dorna. And now, the article by Elizabeth Baumann. Elizabeth Baumann Dolphus, 1895-1947, actively participated in the development of eurythmy from the summer of 1913. Later, she was the first eurythmy teacher at the Waldorf School, Stuttgart, founded in 1919. 
She was an active participant of the Eurythmy Therapy Lecture Course. Children of all ages grasped and carried out the movements of Eurythmy so naturally that we experienced every day of our lives that the visible movement language of Eurythmy is a language that is in genuine harmony with the laws and requirements of both man's spiritual and soul nature and his bodily nature. We also experienced daily that hindrances the children had, whether in the realm of the will or in the realm of mental picturing, of the activity of thinking, could be loosened up or actually overcome by Eurythmy. At the Waldorf School, almost from the very beginning, we had to deal with children who had hindrances of this sort. Sometimes these difficulties were only slightly in evidence. Sometimes the children were so overwhelmed by them that they could not keep up with the lessons of their class. A special remedial class was started where they could be given what Rudolf Steiner prescribed for their care. Experience showed that for children of this sort, Eurythmy, more than anything else, could get across to them, and they could take immediate hold of it. Consequently, we asked ourselves whether it would be possible to find exercises that would help the spiritual part that was experiencing such difficulty in incarnating, because it met with such strong bodily resistance. These, exper- these exercises would give the physical sheath a better form, movement exercises that would help the etheric formative forces to penetrate better and give their support to the creative upbuilding forces of the organism. Out of our close connection with difficult cases, with those in need of special care, we acquired the most intense desire to discover and take hold of the healthy therapeutic element of Eurythmy. From many conversations with Erna van de Venter Wolfram, who is actively engaged in Eurythmy in various parts of Germany, it transpired that through the work she was doing, she, too, had been powerfully drawn to this therapeutic aspect of Eurythmy. After due reflection, we decided to ask Dr. Steiner for instructions on Eurythmy therapy. Rudolf Steiner agreed with alacrity and promised to think about it. It was not long before Frau van de Venter and I were requested to go to Dornach in April, where he wanted to give lectures on Eurythmy therapy, alongside the doctor's lecture course he was going to give at the Gertianum. So it was, during the days of 12 to 17 April 1921, that Rudolf Steiner presented the gift of the third element of Eurythmy, and the doctors and Eurythmists who were present experienced a whole new world of possibilities for therapy opening up before them. In its variety and effectiveness, and the way in which Rudolf Steiner presented it, this was bound to have an unforgettable impression on them, Instead of the few instructions and indications we had asked for, we were given a complete and detailed method of Eurythmy therapy, in which we could directly experience that even today the creative and therapeutic power of the Word, with its capacity to take hold of the movement potential in the human body, is still at work. It often happened that it was not easy to find our way into it, For even those of us who for many years had been familiar with the eurythmical art of movement found that the exercises Rudolf Steiner either carried out himself or asked Frau van de Venter Wolfram and myself to carry out were utterly new and surprising. It was especially difficult for the doctors present as only a minority had had anything to do with eurythmy up till then. Two eurythmy courses were set up to practice basic eurythmy with the doctors, and also the exercises that had been given by Dr. Steiner during the eurythmy therapy lecture that day. Regular work at eurythmy therapy now started up in various places, in the clinics in Arlsheim and Stuttgart and also at the Waldorf School Stuttgart. Rudolf Steiner gave several more indications for the use of eurythmy therapy in special cases. He himself varied the one or the other exercise, and he gave certain sound sequences that were to be practiced with individual patients under his special observation. These indications offer doctors and eurythmy therapists a rich opportunity to learn more about a methodical approach, adapting of exercises to the individual needs of patients and the scrupulous observation required for this. 
The real basis of all eurythmy therapy work is given in this lecture course, as is clearly stated in Rosteiner's own words. In October 1922, on the occasion of a medical week in Stuttgart, he was again asked to speak about eurythmy therapy, this time by doctors. That lecture is included here with the 1921 course. Right at the beginning, Rudolf Steiner says, quote, The wish has been expressed for me to expound somewhat further upon eurythmy therapy. Basically, the empirical material relating to eurythmy therapy was developed and presented in the recent lecture course for physicians in Dorna, and it is hardly necessary to go beyond what was given at that time. And that was Collected Works, Volume 313. Used in the proper manner, it will be of far-reaching importance. Close quote. And now a small article by Elizabeth... Isabella de Jaeger. Isabella de Jaeger, 1892 to 1979, eurythmist and eurythmy therapist, from 1928 leader of the eurythmy school at the Gertianum, founding member of the Rudolf Steiner Nachlass Verwaltung, Rudolf Steiner's literary estate, editor of the second German edition of Eurythmy Therapy and the second German edition of Eurythmy as Visible Speech, collected work 279, also to be found on this website. It will soon be evident to the reader that without a thorough study of anthroposophy, he will not get very far with this Eurythmy Therapy lecture course. Eurythmy Therapy arises out of anthroposophy, just the same as artistic Eurythmy does. A living grasp of man and the world is a necessary basis for its use. Only on this assumption will it avoid becoming a system or something that is grasped and applied in an abstract intellectual way an ever-present danger in our times. Eurythmy therapy also requires an extensive knowledge of artistic eurythmy, imaginative forces, the coming into movement of man's whole being, are prerequisites for the application of this therapy, where it is essential to have an artistic understanding of the patient. All the delicate and minute nuances needed in order to help a sick child or adult come to us out of artistic eurythmy. You will continually find new inspiration here. I would like to stress that a young person should not devote him or herself exclusively to eurythmy therapy. Up to the age of 28, a person should be able to give his or her imagination and creative forces free reign. The more this can happen, the better he or she will be able to develop devotion, patience and empathy when doing eurythmy therapy later. It is essential to devote oneself wholly to the patient and carry him her with artistic warmth of heart. As Rudolf Steiner often mentions in the lecture course, eurythmy therapy should never be used without a doctor's thorough diagnosis. The greater the collaboration with the patient's doctor, the more effective the eurythmy therapy will be. And that is the end of the appendix and the end of the book, Eurythmy Therapy, by Rudolf Steiner.